it's a great honor to kind of be here with you all and um, speak to your Advent by Candlelight. Thank you for all kind of your support during this time and um, really this invitation to come speak. I think it's kind of rare for uh, one of your parish priests to come speak and I was like, I mean, he's a big father, Jack, he's, you know, he's a good speaker, but then I realized he's like super long-winded, so he'd be here for, uh, for a long time. Um, yeah, I'm just really grateful to be here. My mom is here, which is awesome to be right here. So, so she kind of helped take care of me when I was in the hospital, so spent every night in the ICU with me. And um, there's a few moments, I remember in the ER, I was lucid and um, the nurse or whoever was like, okay, is this your wife? And I was like, yo, it's my freaking mom, man. Like, come on, man. what's going on? That happens a lot. My, yeah, the cardiovascular surgeon thought she was my sister and I was like, please, this is my mother. Um, and really just, yeah, grateful to God in general to just be here, be able to stay in front of you and, and, uh, and participate in this Advent by Candlelight. Um, the theme, as we heard for this evening, is listen to my voice and its emphasis on silence. Um, silence is a great teacher that teaches some of our deepest lessons of our lives. That was part of the description that we heard earlier. And it's so true, I would say. Um, but then we often think of silence as like prayer time or adoration or, or retreat. Uh, but tonight, I, maybe, I just want to reflect on silence in terms of pain. Uh, and maybe it's because pain's been on my mind the last like two weeks of my life. Um, but there were a lot of lessons in that silence. I remember being in the back of this EMSA truck after my brother and my mom found me face down in the bathroom and trying to stay awake, fading in and out and, and thinking, is this it? Right, I can't talk, I can't speak. And I remember thinking like, is this how I die? And I remember making an act of, act of contrition in silence and telling Jesus, hey, I'm, I'm really, really sorry for my sins. Just FYI, if there's any like, <laughs> do you have any issues? Like, I am, I'm, 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 I'm sorry for these sins. But in that silence, I learned in a deeper way God's mercy, right? That in that moment that I could ask for that forgiveness. I remember the silence in the ICU at night, the difficulty of being there often being in pain, often being impatient of wanting to get out of there, but also having a peace and calm that everything was gonna be okay, that I was gonna make it out of this. Or even the silent healing of my wound, that, um, that it got better, that even though I couldn't see it or feel it, I knew it was happening, that I didn't need surgery and that God would take care of it. Or even the silence, taking the time to reflect on my own death, my own mortality, and realizing for myself that if that was it, I'm good. I'm like happy with my life. It was a good 30 years, right? It was, I have a great family, great friends, great community. I've done awesome things. There was nothing that I would have regretted. And that was kind of a great realization for me in that silence. That's what that silence taught me. But at the same time, realizing that the Lord wants more for me. I remember hearing the story about this, this young priest and this old priest, and this old priest was dying. And the old priest tells the young priest, have I done enough? Have I done enough in my life? And the young priest is confused. He's like, well, you're, you know, you're, yeah, you're like in a state of grace. Like you, you know, you've been to confession, you got your last sacraments, like you've, you've been a good priest. Like you shouldn't be worried about not getting to heaven. And the old priest was like, no, 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 no. Did I do enough with what God has given me in my life? that I do enough with the gifts he's bestowed on me and use them in the way that he wanted me to. And I remember praying about that in silence and thinking, yeah, the same thing, that the good Lord has really blessed me. Have I done enough with the gifts he's given me? Because there's some days where I'm just a lazy potato and I just, <laughs> the Lord gives me opportunities and I say no, right? Have I done enough with those gifts that I've been given me? So these lessons, the Lord has taught me really brought at the end more peace and deeper love for him. That pain, right? The silence and that pain brought me really more peace. And in one sense, that's, that's physical pain, right? That's 
pain that hurts. Yet for me, it doesn't leave any kind of trauma in my mind, right? I don't have any kind of lasting wounds that I revisit that there's no kind of PTSD from it. Um, but there's a pain in the sense that is often less addressed and that's emotional pain, right? Physical pain, you can heal from, right? Physical pain, you can, maybe you, maybe it affects you for the rest of your life in some way, but um, in terms of difficulty, in terms of revisiting it in some way, it's not that bad. Emotional pain can be a different animal. Like how do you suffer in that silence, right? How do you suffer in the silence of emotional pain? The pain in the silence of a divorce, right? Going through that isolation, that loss, the pain in the silence of a miscarriage, right? Going through that loss as well. Difficulty in marriage, maybe being distant from your husband, maybe finding out your husband's addicted to pornography, that silence of betrayal, difficulties in parenting with a child, um, not connecting well, resentment, constant arguing, or them leaving the church, right? There's a lot of moments where you suffer in that silence or past abuse in our lives, people that have hurt us sexually, physically, emotionally, or past sins that though they may have happened long ago, still hang over us. These wounds, right, these pains, they have a loud beginning, right? They have moments that begin and end and we can pinpoint where those happen. But when we come back to them, there are moments that we suffer in silence, right? That we go back to that and we can still feel that pain. And even though that moment might've passed days or months and years, when we re revisit them, we can still feel that hurt. We can still feel that pain. And so we can ask, how is silence a teacher? in that moment, right? How can silence teach us in that way? Well, it's the same way that he was a teacher in my physical pain, because God speaks to us in that silence. In the same way he told me that it's gonna be okay, in the same way he told me to live as a better priest, the Lord is speaking in those emotional pains. And he calls us and he allows us, he wants us to speak, to listen to him. Advent is all about Jesus coming, right? Emmanuel, God with us, not just in a manger, but now. And often with those emotional pains, those past wounds, especially the ones that, that still hurt, right? That we still feel that, that kind of hit us on the side. When we go back and visit those and suffer in that silence, what do we do? We often go back alone, right? We often go back by ourselves and we revisit that moment and we still feel that pain and we still feel that isolation or that loss or whatever. My advice to you would be, don't go back there by yourself because that silence isn't gonna teach you anything if Jesus isn't with you. What I would encourage you to do is to invite Jesus with you back to those memories, back to that emotional pain, back into that silence. He loves you in this present moment and he wants you to bring him back to those painful moments where he was actually already there. So I encourage you to take his hand, go back to that hard place and ask Jesus about it. Ask Jesus what he sees, how would he react? I heard this great story about this kid who viewed pornography for the first time and um, he told his parents and um, so his parents took him to um, this like pre psychologist, and you know, you know, he tell this, he was a good kid because he told his parents and all these, all this stuff. And I remember the priest telling me, or asking the kid, okay, what would what would Jesus say if he was in the room when you first viewed pornography? Like, what would Jesus do? And and the kid said, well, he's gonna be really upset. He would be really mad at me. He's gonna, you know like yell at me or, or whatever. And the priest was like, no, 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 no. What would, what would Jesus do if he was in the room with you when that happened? And the kid realized and started crying and said, he'd probably just turn off the computer and give me a hug and say, I'm sorry this happened to you. And that silence, when we invite Jesus into that, into that emotional pain, that's what happens, right? He wants to heal us. In that silence, we hear the voice of our savior saying, you are healed. In that silence, we hear the voice of the Father saying, you are my beloved daughter. In that silence, we feel the peace and joy and gentleness of the Holy Spirit. Because the reality is, all of us are wounded 
in some way, right? We all hold some kind of pain or trauma or wound, and we often hold it in silence, and we hold it by ourselves. And sometimes we realize it, sometimes we don't. Sometimes we wear it on our sleeves, sometimes we suppress it or shut it down. But it's in that silence where Jesus wants to meet us, right? That's in that silence where he wants us to be healed. And that's kind of the whole theme of Christmas, right? Jesus is born unnoticed in the silence, born into the world that is like a disaster, right? Things are a mess that's wounded and hurt and he's sent to save it. But he also wants to be born in your life as well, right? to do what he came to do, to fix that mess, to heal that wound, that hurt, to be our savior. And the Lord is patient with us in that healing process, right? Because often we try to take it over and do it ourselves and, and fix it and be like, all right, here, Lord, here's, I, I figure, figure it out so you can, you know, I can approach you. No, he wants to be a part of it and make us new, to be patient in him, to trust in him in that sounds to do that really kind of hard work to invite him into that, right? To go back to those memories, to invite Jesus into it and ask us, ask him to heal us. Advent is all about waiting for him to come into our lives in a radical way and to make us new. And he makes himself poor to us, right? In those moments of poverty, of those moments of emotional pain, he's not opposed to that, right? He's actually attracted to it, right? He's attracted to our weakness is attracted to our poverty. That's why he's our savior. So maybe an Advent reflection that you can do on your own, maybe you have some kind of painful trauma or pain or suffering that you revisit. Maybe there's something that is a wound in your heart that is still there that hasn't been healed. Don't go there alone. Invite Jesus into that. Allow him to be born in that moment. Allow, allow yourself to see, okay, what would he say to you in this moment? How would he look at, with, at you? How would he touch you? How would he respond in this moment? It can be an incredibly healing experience to allow him to go back there, right? Because once again, when we suffer in silence, we're not gonna learn anything. But if you bring Jesus there, who is the great teacher, he is there also as our savior and our healer. Jesus came into the world not just to save us collectively, but each and every one of us. And he came to save us not just at the end of our lives or at the end of time, but, but now to save us from our wounds, to save us from our sins, to save us from those lies that we believe. The reality is we just have to let him, right? We just have to be vulnerable to invite him into that silence of pain and let him be the teacher, the healer and the savior. And good evening, everyone. I'm kind of mad that I have to follow Father Vince on there. Um, and I feel like I should tell you that I'm super nervous, um, just in case I pass out or something. Um, I'm not used to speaking in front of large groups of people, especially about myself. So looking out at everyone here tonight and knowing there are more people watching me from home is somewhat terrifying for me. However, I'm honored that Esther asked me to do it. And something that I realized is that she tends to ask me to do things that I find myself uncomfortable doing, but they're good for me. And so I'm better for doing them. So thank you, Esther. And here I am. I'll start by giving you a little background about me. I'm a Tulsa girl, born and raised. I went to college in Stillwater, Oklahoma State University. I thought that might happen. Yes, I'm a cowboy, loyal and true, and I'm sorry I can't stop myself from saying something about beating OU last weekend. I mean, how exciting was that game, OSU fans? I'm really not trying to be ugly or rub it in, but we don't get the chance to do this very often. So, go Pokes! <laughs> anyway, hopefully I haven't offended half the crowd. Um, I moved back to Tulsa, and I've lived here ever since. I grew up in a loving home with amazing parents. My family is Baptist, 
And when I got married, I, we started attending um, St. Mary after we started having children. Um, my, when my oldest was in the bunny class, so that was about eight years ago, and I converted to Catholicism and have been Catholic for about seven years now. Before the pandemic, we usually went to the 1030 Mass. And once my youngest is fully vaccinated, which she got our last shot on Monday, we will be back. We will be back. I catch myself saying that a lot. We'll be back to sports, back to the office. Have you noticed saying that? Back, as in back to something like before the pandemic. I have a younger sister named Tiffany. And when we were growing up, my parents used to say BT for before Tiffany or AT for after Tiffany. I don't really know why they did it, but they did. So guess what? To my children's horror and mine too, because it means I'm turning into them, I do it now. I have a BE for before my son Eli, and you know you get the picture. So um, I have a BP for you guessed it before the pandemic. And I've switched it up a little because I've added a DP for during the pandemic. And as we all are, I'm looking forward to an AP for after the pandemic. Anyway, BP, my family was pretty active. My husband and I both worked full-time jobs. Our kids were active in school and involved in several extracurricular activities. I kept pretty busy volunteering in school and church and shuttling my kids around all their activities. So when the pandemic hit, it drastically changed our day-to-day -day lives. We were no longer able to go to mass. We were no longer able to go to school or into the office. We were no longer able to participate in extracurricular activities like dance, piano lessons, basketball, baseball, or lacrosse. We were no longer able to have sleepovers with friends or spend time with Nana. Just lots and lots of no longers. But because we were no longer able to do those things, we found ourselves with so much extra time we had more time to do things that we wanted to do previously, but just didn't have the time to do it. Things like paint the house, paint the garden, or sit down every night for a meal together. We were able to spend more time with each other, and we had the opportunity to be still and listen to my voice. Silence is a teacher. Within it, we learn some of the deepest lessons of our lives about loneliness and intimacy, joy, sorrow, conflict, and peace. When we speak less to the world and everything in it, we enter into a silence in which we can listen to the story of life, to other people and to our own heart. The week of March 16th, 2020, my entire office went home to work virtually for what we thought would just be a few weeks. I remember I stopped at two Walgreens on my way home to buy toilet paper, um, and they had none on the shelf that day. That was also the week of spring break and my kids were sent home for what ended up being virtual learning for the remainder of the school year. At that time I was married and my now ex-husband worked in a call center. Not long after the kids and I were sent home, his job changed to a virtual position too. So he also began working from home. That made for a lot of people tiled in one, piled into one tiny house. We have a 1200 square feet house so, with one bathroom. Um, so we were always together pretty much 24 hours a day, seven days a week. We found ourselves trying to coordinate and navigate lots of new, confusing, and honestly, sometimes pretty scary things. The uncertainty of the world around us was dramatic and it changed our daily lives. And it seemed to bring out the good and bad and at times the very ugly in all of us. A friend of mine used this parable at a retreat I recently went to and it resonated with me. You've probably heard it before. The story is about an old Cherokee Indian that spoke with his grandson about life. He said to his grandson, a fight is going on inside me. It is a horrible fight and it's between two wolves. One is evil, he is anger, envy, sorrow, regret, greed, arrogance, self-pity, guilt, resentment, inferiority, lies, false pride, superiority, and ego. He continued, the other is good. He is joy, peace, love, hope, serenity humility, kindness, benevolence, empathy, generosity, truth, compassion, and faith. The same fight is going on inside you and inside every other person too. <clears throat> the grandson thought about it for a minute and then asked his grandfather, which wolf will you feed? 
the old Cherokee simply, I'm sorry, which wolf will win? The old Cherokee simply replied, the one that you feed. I think all human beings search for joy, peace, hope, and serenity. But at the beginning of the pandemic, feeding that wolf proved to be difficult for me. My ex-husband had battled alcoholism for a long time, probably longer than I was even aware of. If you can remember when the pandemic began, so many things were completely shut down. Restaurants and bars were shut down, AA meetings were shut down. So for him, that meant he had nowhere else to go, good or bad, other than home. Nothing to occupy his time or thoughts. The stillness was not good for him. And because, because of it, he was no longer able to hide what he was doing from us. I filed for divorce in May of 2020, and it was final in November of that year. <clears throat> God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. This is a prayer that I believe is said at all AA meetings, and I used to despise it for that reason. I hated it because it reminded me of the hurt that alcohol alcoholism had brought upon my family. However, unknowingly, my sweet friend helped change that connotation for me. Quite fittingly, she began every home and school meeting with a serenity prayer that year. And at the end of the year, she gave us all a framed copy of it. It was perfect guidance for us during that crazy year. And for me, it helped put some things in perspective. The realization was freeing. I believe that one of the biggest challenges in life is learning to accept people or situations for what they truly are. And I think that the sooner you realize that your expectations of something cannot change it, the better off you'll be. Getting over a painful experience is much like crossing monkey bars. You have to let go at some point in order to move forward. C.S. Lewis. One of the happiest moments in life is when you finally find the courage to let go of what you can't change. My divorce wasn't the end of something good. It was the end of something broken. You may dwell on making something work, but when it's a person or situation that you cannot control or change and you finally let go, the pressure lessens, the stress abates, allowing you the opportunity to be still and listen to my voice. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Psalm 46.10. I would say that the pandemic forced me to be still, which gave me the opportunity to fully listen to the Holy Spirit. There have been a few notable times in my life that I have been forced to be still and listen, the pandemic being one of them. And another, when I was 19 years old, I was diagnosed with leukemia. It was the summer before my sophomore year of college. The first round of chemo was probably the hardest for me. And one of the worst side effects I experienced were these horrible ulcers in my mouth. They left me unable to eat, drink, or speak. When you're unable to speak, all you can do is listen. During that time, I remember making several deals with God. If you get me through this, I will never, or I will always, blah, blah, blah. And although I never physically heard God's voice, I did fill him with me. I know now that's why I was able to keep a pretty positive attitude during that time. I just wanted to get through my treatment and on with my life. Some of that gumption was probably youth, but most of it was the Holy Spirit cheering me on, giving me strength. He gave me strength and peace when I needed it most. He also spoke to me by showing me things that I had taken for granted. I think he has a way of doing that. I noticed the beauty in nature after I hadn't been able to go outside and experience for, for a while. I appreciated the taste and smell of fresh fruits and vegetables after not being able to eat them when my immune system was low. I felt the power of genuine love and friendships. I had so many people reach out to me during that time and tell me how much they loved me or how much I meant to them. I never would have experienced that or known the depths of it if not for my cancer diagnosis. I actually thought about how many people would be at my funeral if I died and felt good about myself. And then I thought how I needed a new dress for it. That's youth, I'm sure. Um, the Holy Spirit slowed me down and showed me true beauty through an experience that was so ugly and it was during a very impressionable time in my life. I think I'm a better person because of it 
and it was my first experience of really speaking and listening to God. At the retreat I, retreat I spoke about earlier, we were asked to talk about listening or hearing God's voice. One of the ladies at my table said that she does actually physically hear him speak to her. Another one said that she's tried to hear him and knows that other people hear him, but she just has never heard him speak. I think the Holy Spirit has always spoken to me, but I've just recently realized how he was doing it. I think that what I once thought was intuition or luck or just a feeling was actually the Holy Spirit speaking to me, guiding me, helping me notice things. He's been guiding me through life through things both big and small. I try to recognize it in everything now, like when there's just enough milk in the bottle for pancakes or that front row parking spot when it's raining outside. I just smile and say, I know that was you, God. Thank you. When my pipes burst in January and I found my stimulus check was deposited into my account the day the plumbers came to fix it, I once would have thought that was just some great luck or a coincidence, but I know better now. It was the Holy Spirit taking care of me. When I was given the opportunity to work from home during the pandemic, it gave me more time to spend with my kids during a pretty rough time in our lives. I recognize that as another gift from the Holy Spirit. He put me in a job that allowed that to happen. I was moved by one of Pope Francis's homilies earlier this year. He said, I believe in this time of the pandemic, it is good for us to remember even of the times we have suffered, suffered the most, not to make us sad, but so as not to forget and to guide us in our choices in the light of the very recent past. I wonder, how does our memory work? To simplify, we could say that we remember someone or something when it touches our heart, when it binds us to a particular affection or lack of affection. And so, the heart of Jesus heals our memory because it brings us back to the fundamental, to the fundamental affection. It roots it on the most solid base. It reminds us that whatever happens to us in life, we are loved. Yes, we are loved beings, children whom the Father loves always, and in any case, brothers and sisters, for whom the heart of Christ beats. I love that, the heart of Christ beats for me. I mean, how very simple and remarkable is that? We are loved. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love, as the Beatles most eloquently put it, love is all you need. <laughs> Another thing Pope Francis said that I really liked is that we are people who need healing. We need Jesus to heal our memory, bring it back to what touches our heart, and I couldn't agree more. We have all experienced tough times in our lives, and everyone's story is different, but everyone has a story. It's what makes us who we are. Heal me, O Lord, and I shall be healed. Save me, and I shall be saved, for you are my praise. Jeremiah 17, 14. Life can be hard sometimes, but from that there can be great beauty. Choose to feed the good wolf inside of you. Choose to see the beauty around you. Choose to recognize the blessings given to you. Choose to not be sad about what the world used to be, but excited about what it can become. Choose to be still and listen. So that when you hear what the Holy Spirit is telling you, then act on it. She is clothed in strength and dignity, and she laughs without fear of the future. Proverbs 31, 25. I'd like to close tonight with a quote from St. Teresa of Calcutta. It really touched my heart. May today there be peace within. May you trust that you are exactly where you are meant to be. May you not forget the infinite possibilities that are born of faith in yourself and others. May you use the gifts that you have received and pass on the love that has been given to you. May you be content with yourself just the way you are. Let this knowledge settle into your bones and allow your soul the freedom to sing, dance, praise, and love. It is there for each and every one of us. Thank you.